artificial and intelligence, designing writing assignments in the age of AI. Oh, no. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, a little bit about assignment design, a little bit about AI, a lot about plagiarism just in general. Uh, and we're going to be kind of talking about where we have come from in terms of our context and our situation in terms of plagiarism, and then trying to situate ourselves in this sort of new AI reality. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit throughout the talk about some opportunities, some things that you can do in uh, your own courses, but I just want to start uh, by saying that I've thought a lot about writing in my lifetime and in my career. Um, this is something I'm deeply passionate about. I've thought a lot about how to avoid plagiarism, how to teach students, how to um, approach writing with a growth mindset. But I'm not an AI expert in any stretch of the imagination. So what I am is a reader, I'm a learner, I'm a curious person. So cult I've kind of curated some things for you today that I have found really interesting and thoughts and experiences that I've had in my own classes. But I expect that you all are also coming in with your own level of uh, entry level AI expertise as teachers. Uh, so I hope throughout this, uh, presentation, you'll feel free to ask questions and, you know, make any observations that you have, and then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for a discussion. Um, I wanted to start, though, <laughs> by telling you about my hopes uh, for the writing future of Salvador Rodriguez University, <laughs> um, mostly just so I can start socializing some of these conversations and take the opportunity any way I can. But also because as we think about how AI impacts our teaching and learning, it's really inextricable from the way that we think about written and oral communication moving forward. So as many of you know, we recently adopted a new set of core learning outcomes. And one of those is to communicate effectively. Um, our goal for the students is to help them over the course of the four years that they're here, learn how to communicate, uh, connect information, inform, persuade, plan writing, craft writing, cultivate it, and to do so for a variety of functions, audiences, and contexts. Um, what I think that means to me, though, is that as we start to move forward in thinking about uh, how we want to teach all of our students how to write and to communicate, we need to remember that writing and oral communication skills, and we're going to talk about the, flexible, <laughs> the flexibility of that in just a moment, but th those are tools for learning and thinking. They are not just products. They're not just ways that they demonstrate mastery or showcase mastery of a particular subject. They are opportunities to actually showcase and to practice learning and to demonstrate the thought process in your classrooms. And so I think that's something that I want to foreground and that we will return to as we talk about strategies for writing assignments in our classroom, uh, because it, if we think about writing as a product, we start to get ourselves into um, the question of how AI might take over that product. Um, also, as we think about writing and communication, and I see folks here from so many different disciplines, which is really wonderful, um, it's really important that we think about writing and oral communication as a shared responsibility. Um, it needs to be integrated into all of our academic disciplines because almost all of our disciplines have to communicate our knowledge out in the world in some way, shape, or form. And so to really think about that as not just being something that is a role of writing instructors or any individual class, but it's something that we all need to think about how to do. And that writing itself is something that has to be continually improved and developed. I don't know about any of you, but I know that for me, I don't walk into this room as a perfect writer. I don't expect to become a perfect writer at any point in my lifetime. And it's the thing that I care the most about in the whole world except for, I guess, my family. So <laughs> um, students should encounter scaffolded writing concepts throughout their um, time as students because they're also going to continue developing those skills well beyond the walls of this institution. Um, the students need to be thinking about scaffolded instruction both in their classroom, but over the course of time in each of their individual majors, right? So it's up to all of us to really think about 
about what does it look like for a student to grow over time as a person who's communicating in this discipline for the field that they're going into, whether they're going to continue on with their academics or whether they're going to go out into the world immediately and immediately begin communicating. Um, and also, I just want to say, for the sake of this, and almost every time you speak to me, <laughs> writing is something that I define really flexibly. Um, writing and oral communication is something that involves a lot of different competencies, and it's something that is mutable. Time uh, changes how we think about what writing is. For a lot of people who come from the rhetoric and composition field, they really define writing as like anything that has shapes or representations that represent concepts out in the world. And so um, when we think about writing, I want us to think about product, sure, but digital competency, information literacy skills, research techniques, um, how we orally communicate both in discussions, but also in terms of presenting information, visual literacy, how we communicate information in many of our fields is often visual, critical reading skills, which are an inextricable part of the, the communication literacies, um, critical thinking skills, and then any other kind of characteristics. And like I said, when AI, that may look different in a year. It's already different than it was the last time I talked to, to folks here on campus in a public way about AI. The other thing is that almost anybody who participates in any sort of writing instruction and every organization out there that supports writing would say that writing and communication instruction requires constant interrogation, reflection, and support. I know that a lot of you aren't trained as writing instructors, and so if I say I'd really like you to take some responsibility for writing instruction, that might be overwhelming. But the goal is not for you to do that in isolation or to be solely responsible for the entirety of a student's learning. It's to do it in a supported way. So a little plug for writing there. <laughs> now I want to take us back to like a pre-AI time period and let's just talk a little bit about what plagiarism actually is. And um, so I love etymology and so I, I thought it was nice to kind of look at where the actual roots of the words came from. Uh, obviously, it comes out of the Latin and the Greek. It's really about uh, thievery. It's about kidnapping. Um, over time, and it also, um, I thought this definition that it was a kidnapper, seducer, plunderer, or one who kidnaps the child or slave of another was just um, a lot to unpack. And so I wanted to actually put it on the screen for all of you to contend with as well. Um, it's an old term, and uh, just like everything else in education, you know, the, the grading system that we use now is only like 100 years old, but this is something that it, we've actually been contending with for thousands of years, back in um, dealing with the earliest stretches of um, academia. However, the word plagiarism itself doesn't really come into fruition until 1620. So that's just something that I really to, to start off by thinking about. And so what I'd like to ask you to do first, and I know there's a few of you who are here with us online, you can drop the answers into the chat if you'd like, or you can do a little free writing at home. Um, but I'd love for you to turn to the person who is sitting next to you, and I want you to, to think about together for just a moment or two, why do students plagiarize? And I want you to think about it from that student perspective, not why you think they, like, they're plagiarized, why do you think students are engaging in plagiarism. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not
And I want to be careful and say that might be because the student doesn't know how to paraphrase. It might not be somebody sitting around and thinking, well, if I change a few words, they won't notice. It's often more that nobody has actually taught them the thorough skill of what paraphrasing actually is. Um, contract cheating, which we're going to talk a little bit more about as we get into the AI conversation, is really where you're actually hiring somebody to uh, write for you. And there are different types of software that have tried to contend with this by looking at or measuring voice. And so if you think the conversation around AI is new, it's really not it's something that we've been uh, bringing into our software and higher education for a while. Um, and also like online paraphrasers, this sort of computer assisted paraphrasing where you can actually put your writing in or put a quote in and actually have the computer generate a paraphrase of it for you. That's not new. It is uh, becoming more intelligent, but it is a software that's existed for quite a long time. Um, a lot of times students just forget or they will miss cite. Sometimes they will put the wrong uh, author's name or they'll put the wrong article title. Um, there's all kinds of different plagiarism. And I just wanted to start out by thinking about that because what we need to know though is that up until now, and I don't have any metrics now, so I'm not making a claim about the current situation, most types of plagiarism is accidental plagiarism. Most of the time, students who are having even larger quantities of it are suffering from some skill development. Um, and it could be because of the other things that you mentioned. It could be that they haven't managed their time well or that they haven't really engaged in it. They don't care about it or that they don't understand how to do it. But most of the time when you're seeing it, it is accidental plagiarism, especially if it's integrated into it. So what I'll see a lot of the time in my classes, um, and you can't really judge uh, turn it in by a particular percent. I would never recommend doing that. But I'll see really high percentages and then it'll be like sort of integrated throughout the paper. And that often tells me that the student just doesn't fully understand how to grapple with information. And it's not something that's explicit to um, first year students. Um, if any of you are graduate student instructors, this is a really common problem for um, graduate students, especially if they're returning after a number of years away from higher education. Um, and so I think this is just something to kind of keep in mind as we think about our approach, not only to how we contend with plagiarism in our class, but how we start to think about the utilization of AI tools in the future of our, of our classrooms. Um, but I also want to talk about the landscape that's really different for our students. Uh, it's not necessarily something that's explicit to this new, I don't want to do the, like the new generation thing, because people like Bob Dylan have been doing this <laughs> for a long time, and um, even in maybe the, the Nobel lecture. Um, but what I want to say is that plagiarism and ideas are really complicated in the first place, and how we manage information and how we use inspiration can be really complicated. So I really like this quote from Lawrence Lessig, and I usually use this with my students to help them talk about the concept of plagiarism in our classes. Um, the idea is that we know that it's wrong to steal a picnic table from our next door neighbor's yard, but if I go by the exact same thing, and I don't tell them about it, but I just put it in my yard, do I have to give them credit? And I think that this is something that we're starting to see all the time because of the rise of internet culture. Um, you might think about it as memes, but TikTok, we've got all of these systems that are existing for our students that are talking about information as being something that's shared, right? It is common to take a meme and adapt it as your own without giving any credit to the original person. It is something now that some of the software like TikTok and Instagram have tried to, to incorporate where they give the original author's um, voice credit or their dance credit, but that's wrong all the time, right? It only takes a few people misappropriating it, uh, misusing the citation to get that wrong. I think the other thing is that just in general, where ideas come from and where inspiration come from is really complicated. As an educator, I'm sure as all of you have experienced, but also as a creative writer, so much of my early time in school was learning how to copy other writers' voices. And so I was reading a lot and taking that in and 
trying to spit out something that was mine, but also probably was somebody else's thing. <laughs> um, I had ideas that I didn't necessarily realize were something that maybe I would heard somebody else talk about. And so I think where ideas come from and how we attribute information in the ecosystem of the internet is really, really messy. When our students come into our classroom and we expect them to behave differently. We expect them to understand information in a way that has never been true for them their entire lives. And so that's something I want us to think about as we also start to think about how our students are going to be grappling with um, the use of AI tools, but also what that means for our future students. The students that we're going to get in five years, the students that we're going to get in 10 years, because that is the same that it was when Wikipedia came out. It's the same as when Google started to be something that people were born into. Um, and now we have to think about how this is going to change the landscape moving forward. So thinking about that first, I wanted to then turn this question to all of you. So we have you pair up again. Um, and I want you to think about why don't you want students to, if maybe you do, maybe you love the idea of it, so I might be asking a leading question here, but why don't you want students to use AI tools in the classroom or even on a spectrum? Why don't you want them to use it all the time? What worries do you have for your students' learning abilities? based on the arrival and this sort of becoming more prevalent AI system. So I want to give you another two minutes to talk to your neighbors about this question. <laughs> <laughs>
the expediency and product focus. I think I'm going to follow on that. So by focusing on the expediency, you offload that really deep comfort you have with the material that takes time to acquire. It's hard to do. But when you don't have that later on, you then become incapable of cross connecting subjects. So it's cheap and easy at the beginning, but it's harder at the end. You don't have that deep knowledge. But it's faster. So I mean, I don't know. And I wonder if the next generation, because they're so they're such good consumers of technology, and let's face it, if you're over the age of 25, you're not. They grow up with that and they're comfortable with that. And we're not. So I don't know if they see that as a problem because they maybe would just be like, well, we just pull that from the internet, where we would not be comfortable with that. We feel like we have to go in. So maybe that's just a generational gap. I don't know. There are, I, I completely agree. There are also studies that indicate that digital natives are not necessarily competent in digital literacy the way that often we are, even though I agree, no, we're they're slower on the taste. They're awful, awful at being literate, but they're yeah. consumers. Yeah, they're great. Absolutely. Excellent clarification. Thank you. I think they've kind of removed some of the human component in writing also when you actually do it because. I don't know, I just think it's too perfect, you know, not the, mm. I, I don't know, it, I just, you know, it doesn't engage the person at all in the environment that's mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. 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 So the, the loss of humanity and the loss of capacity yeah. to communicate. Arlene and then Paula. Uh, my concern about, when you talked before about plagiarism and students have done by accident and everything, isn't there? I don't know what they get with high school, but it's under the university of course for them to do an intro course like at UND 101 where everybody's supposed to know and learn what is plagiarism or that EG bid is not accurate when they try to use it for their citations that like we edit it because it's not correct. It's got problems with it. And the same thing about Plagiarism, of like, oh, but I cited it. So it was a quotation. You didn't put quotation marks in the middle. Isn't there, don't they have a class of salary that everybody has to take? <laughs> We do have a university seminar and we've talked a little bit, a few of us have talked about some tools that we can start to put in that do really do more for the plagiarism aspect of it. But what we don't have at uh Sally is a is a dedicated uh first year writing class that's focus is entirely on writing and that has um consistency, not necessarily in terms of topic or approach, but consistency in writing instruction or um approach to like process uh instruction writing instruction they have outcomes that look very much like writing based outcomes but they're also passion seminars that are taught by faculty across the discipline who are not explicitly taught in the instruction of first year writing uh which is a uh, long now established field in higher education. We do not have a red comp department here. Oh, yeah. We have awesome instructors in our university seminars. I just want to be very clear as, as we talk about these that the university seminars, while they have writing outcomes, were not designed explicitly to be composition one and composition two. Um, which is a departure from common structures at institutions across the country. Paul? I'm concerned that they're not going to learn how to write as a developmental process if they're constantly just getting these lovely sentences that they just use from AI. It would be like me watching videos of some great athlete, but I'm not doing the exercise to get to that point. They're observing, but they're not writing the process. So that's, they're looking at the AI and they're using it. Yeah. All of these things are things I share. I also share uh, something that I think is kind of echoed in all of this is uh, the acceptance of information at face value. Um, I'm surprised all the time but that my students do that even before AI. And now that AI is out there and often makes, makes up sources. Um, I am deeply concerned about what that means for the information landscape, but I'm worried about our students' critical thinking. And I think so much of this comes back to 
their thinking process and their ability to actually create things out of it. Because if they don't know how to think about it, then it's really difficult to actually um, put that into any way of communicating that out into the world. Just to remind you, I don't have all the answers. I wish that I did. A lot of thoughts on composition instruction though. Sorry, Arlene. <laughs> um, I do wanna say that when we think about plagiarism and concerns as we move into this new realm, I know that people are really worried about it. And I would say that some of the things that we're really concerned about, um, what it seems our concerns are, are very much about the learning of the student. But in terms of catching students who are cheating, Contract plagiarism has existed. I've had students in my class turn in assignments that their parents wrote, or in some cases, their children wrote. Um, I've had students uh, who have paid for things. It's easy to see that their voices aren't their own. And I think that that's true in the same way. We need to think about uh, the writing assistance of AI as being something that is used in a number of different ways, the same way you might use your parents in your writing process development in a lot of different ways. And a lot of students go to their parents and sometimes get really heavy editing. On to Patrick's presentation earlier today. And so I think there are a lot of really good ideas about how to incorporate um, writing artificial intelligence tools in the classroom and in terminology framework. So AI-assisted writing tools are the entire spectrum of tools, right? That could be something that helps you, like a plagiarist, a, a paraphrase generator. That would be AI-assisted writing. AI-generated text would be text that is primarily generated by one of these chatbots. Um, and then AI-assisted paraphrasing is the content into their papers. Um, I think it's important because I know probably everybody comes into this room with a different set of uh, background information. And so this is not all the large language models. There are actually like a lot of them and that is not my area of expertise. But a few of them that are getting a lot of it are going to change the way we all interact with our Microsoft tools. And I think it'll happen subtly over time and even we won't necessarily notice how much we've started to integrate it. Um, but some of these like ChatGPT is also available as an app on your phone now. And even though you do have to pay money for GPT-4, which is better but not perfect, um, ChatGPT is just at your fingertips. And so if you're not familiar with the large language models, any of these are systems that have been trained on tremendous amounts a string of sentences, of logical concepts, of logical words in a row. So in my class, what I've seen is the outcome of this, which I think is very funny, but unfortunate for some students, is like the generation of sources that are completely made up, or maybe even half of a title is accurate and the other half is entirely made up, with authors that write for that type of a newspaper, but not necessarily their right first and last name. It's really trying to make good predictions. And so you need to think about it in that way, even when you ask it questions that involve math or science, 
I've asked it numerical questions and it's giving me some strange answers as well. And so it's going to get better, it's going to change, but I just want to kind of contextualize it as something that's right now using that, um, that mode of operating. Has everybody in here played with chat GPT? Is anybody not? Okay, great. So I, this is just about 30 seconds. Um, I asked it to, to uh, outline a presentation on teaching, designing, writing. they are in the classroom. So we might be saying, we don't want you to use this. 
And everybody else is saying, this is gonna be the most important tool for students to, to learn uh, in their business futures. And so we have to contend with that mixed messaging from the public to students. They're getting a lot of information about how to use it well on TikTok. And so all of this is something you just need to think about as you're thinking about how to incorporate it in your classroom. I'm gonna skip this slide. I will share this with you later because I'm almost out of time. What are your responsibilities as instructors? Um, you need to discuss, as I keep saying, you need to discuss plagiarism with your students, the, the, the boundaries that you have and the implications for their learning um, with your students. And it doesn't have to be like huge amounts of instruction, but to remember that they need to hear those messages more than once. You saying it the first day of class in your syllabus isn't enough. That's really important. Um, it's also important for them to understand the why. I think maybe Matt, it was you that said this earlier. If they don't care about the assignment and they don't see a purpose in it, then they don't care about doing the assignment. They're going to produce either a bad assignment or they're gonna find some way to, to expedite it. Um, and so we need to find ways to help them see relevancy in the coursework that we're doing across all of our disciplines. You need to clarify with them your stance on AI tools. If it's allowed and if it's not allowed, they need to know that. And they need to know your level of awareness of the tool. Because if they think that you're unaware of it, then they're going to make assumptions about what they can get away with. It doesn't mean you need to take a punitive, preventative uh, attitude. It doesn't mean you have to try to catch people before they've done something wrong. But just so you know, like this is an assignment where I encourage you to use this as a brainstorming tool. I would like for you to not use it at all. That will make a difference for 90% of your students. There might be one or two that decide they don't want to listen to you, but in my experience this semester, that student wouldn't have done anything differently no matter how much I wanted him to care about writing. Um, writing instruction, as I said earlier, is everyone's responsibility. And that means that the writing tasks in your class are unique to those students. Transfer of writing knowledge is really hard between discipline, but also between classes. It's also really hard between spring and fall when they've had the entire summer to do no writing. Um, and so it's important that when you think about your writing assignments, you think about the skills that you expect them to have. Because they, you may be, as I have caught myself doing many times, making assumptions about what they bring to the table. You need to show them that you care about their writing. The same way that it's important for them to understand the context, that doesn't mean I give lengthy feedback. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but you do need to show them that you're reading it. If you don't ever check their citations, then it doesn't matter that AI is making it up. I'm not saying you need to check every citation that a student ever gives you, but you need to have some moments in class where you're interacting with them, where you're showing them things. If they believe you care, they will perform for you. Um, and not that education needs to be performative, so I'll unpack that later, sorry. Um, <laughs> provide safe classroom environments for them to make mistakes. If they feel like they can make a mistake, then they don't have to worry about the product being perfect. That also might mean you change where you're grading and what things you're grading as a part of this process. So if what you care about is the thinking process, grade the components of their product that are thinking oriented. You do not have to necessarily have an academic paper to be doing writing in your classes. And so thinking about where you can um, give them feedback and give them uh, grades if you are into grades uh, on that work. A couple, I really like this article from the Chronicle. I linked it in here, so I'm sure this will be shared. Um, Anna Mills has done a lot of compilation of materials about uh, AI generation. And she wrote this great article after using ChatGPT4. Some of you may have seen this, but basically her big takeaways were that it's really unlikely that we can outprompt ChatGPT. And I don't think we can approach education from that way. If I do this, then I'll make it a prompt that's better for my students. Or how do I turn this into this? You're just, I've done it. We're just wasting time feeding ChatGPT more data. That's all we're doing, right? So you can try your prompts, but I think there are bigger questions to ask. It again can produce personal sounding writing. It's not necessarily like deep or always deeply humanistic. Sometimes it's a little weird, but it's passable if it's like something that you are not taking seriously as a component of your own class. 
Uh, a lot of people will tell you that that's the solution to make sure you're assigning metacognitive things. I would say that works, especially if you're doing it inside the classroom, like the one minute paper, the one minute reflection on Canvas. That's awesome because they're doing it on the spot. But don't think that just because you're asking it something personal doesn't mean that they can't use it. And writing the A I can do is still worth assigning. And I just love her takeaways uh, from this, so I wanted to talk about them. These are also from Anna Mills, and one of the things that she talks about is that there, some of these are I've added into, but privacy concerns, you know, if you are feeding your students work into other chat detectors, you are risking uh, exposing personal information about your students. <laughs> um, and number two, you're also risking sharing their data and giving their words away without their permission. And so, I would say if you're interested in using a detector, as perfect or imperfect as any of them are, your safest bet right now is to use Turnitin because it is somebody, it is an organization that has already grappled with student, their responsibility towards students and their data. And I know there are a lot of other detectors out there and it's really appealing to use them, but I think that we have an ethical responsibility in how we treat our students as well. And if we haven't told them that we're gonna be using those detectors, then I think that that's a problem. Um, these are really high energy consumers, the same way like crypto technology is really high. So if you're concerned about the internet, like, I mean, your, your uh, ecological footprint, you might want to take a look into how much energy this is consuming and think about how we engage in that. Um, we have not fully grappled with copyright issues about the data that ChatGPT and other language models are using. We don't know what those training data sets are. We don't know where it came from. And so we don't know when it's paraphrasing very well other people's ideas. There's not a lot of transparency and there's a ton of built-in bias. Um, and it's gonna be learning bias as it continues to grow and so that's something really important and coming right up against time here um yeah do you want to stop so you can ask questions or would you like me to talk a little bit about what we could do or would you like to go have coffee yeah. <laughs> you good <laughs> um what can we do we can emphasize purpose and meaning of our assignments uh, we can utilize social annotation tools. If you're not using Perusal, it is the best. It's so fun. I switched from using Canvas discussion questions to using social annotation, and I got the same results and I had a lot less grading to do because I could actually just look over their annotations and think about how that would guide our discussion rather than looking at discussion posts after the discussion posts where the students were like, yes, I agree. I, so I think that's really cool. It also shows students how to take notes because some students are really good at it. You can also engage in that practice with them. Um, incorporate brainstorming process or reflection into your assignment. Do a little bit of in-class writing, even if it's just having them do a brainstorm right in front of you. That is one thing that you might have a chance of seeing that will tell you when something has gone wrong. I had students do a source annotation before they wrote a reflective essay about a book that we read and I had them use it. It was easy to tell the students who were using ChatGPT because they use completely different sources. And so, and they were made up also, but it was really easy for me to spot because I had done some really little things that I don't even know if I created for them more than just a completion. Um, encourage synthesis of ideas. If you're worried about critical thinking, then that's where we've got to put our focus. We don't want to focus on the products. We want to focus on how we're teaching them to do it. And so thinking about that, thinking about different ways of, of editing that. If you're interested in that, we can talk more about it later. Um, experiment with multimodalities. A lot of people say podcast production is, I think this is a really hard thing to do, but um, <laughs> it, they say that podcast production often requires them to have a conversation with another person, which means that they have to actually prepare for the conversation and then have the conversation. So coming up with strategies like that, which force them to actually grapple with each other. Um, experiment with other kinds of multimodalities as well. And then make the students responsible to each other. In my creative writing class, I know Jen, we were just talking about this yesterday, when the students are showing up for each other and they're doing work for each other, and that's not just one time for a peer review, but it's the class ecosystem, then they will show up for each other. They don't want to embarrass themselves in front of everybody. And if they're doing work for the other classroom classmates, then they care about it. Uh, I got to see that in the community engaged learning presentation. That the more that we can help our students find meaning in what we're doing, the more they're going to actually engage in this without us asking them. 
then teach information literacy skills. The librarians have a presentation in a little bit. Please go to that. It's, they're so good. Our librarians are amazing. And we really are like believe that writing and research are integrated processes. And so we want to collaborate with each other. So should you play with AI in your classroom? Sure. <laughs> if you want to, that's great. Um, I have a lot of ideas about that, but I have run out of time. So um, if you want to keep this conversation going, I am here all summer. I would love to help you with your own classes or thinking about it. Um, it I think it's something that could be challenging, but I think offers a lot of opportunities for us as well. Thanks.